Okay, so thanks for coming, everybody. So today I'm going to be talking about aspects of human evolution to introduce the, the whole topic to you. When you go to other classes, you get more detail on this, but this is going to think about why our bodies are like they are. Um, and then afterwards, we could do some work in the lab on both evolution of brain size, but evolution of human locomotion. Now, you might think it's funny putting up a picture of a toothbrush right at the beginning, but when we talk about evolution, everybody's got some preconceptions, whether or not uh, English students or whether they're studying civil engineering, or even people who don't study biology have all got um, in, uh, some idea about evolution. And this, this really sort of highlights that. This is an advert from the Sunday papers uh, from, for a toothbrush. And um, you can see, if you look at the previous slide, which is the sort of classic sort of evolution thing you see on t-shirts and all that type of thing with all sorts of um, amusing things at the end. But this is for the toothbrush and they're clearly using that, that icon um, for evolution. And there's some things in it that are true, but there's also some things in it that, that are wrong. It's in, uh, one of the things that's true in this picture is that during evolution, each stage has to be fitter, has to be better than the stage before. So when we're thinking about human evolution, and the adaptations, the things we have to help us function in the environment, each one of those things has got to be better than the one that went before. So standing upright, for example, which we do and chimps don't, as we'll see, standing upright has to be better in the environment in which we're in than not standing upright. The other thing in this, it, that it implies that there's a direction, that evolution inevitably leads to the better, more complicated toothbrush. And of course, if you know anything about evolution, you know that's not true. Evolution has no direction and that non-complexity isn't necessarily um, a final outcome of evolution. And this is important when we think about human evolution because until recently, until post-Darwin really, people, for, people argued and some people still do that humans are the top of the ladder. Humans are the most important thing. Humans are the, the point of evolution. And so hopefully what you'll see in this talk is that that's not the case. We're very special, but we're just different. This is another advert, which I think is quite striking. Um, uh, and it in brings in the idea of human evolution and how those ideas are out there in society. So this is a, an advert for a washing machine. And clearly, um, they're trying to get you to buy a better, more complicated washing machine. So we have some of the ideas from the previous slide in here. And I think what it's saying is evolution, well, it's saying evolution's good, evolution's made things better, but it's also saying this washing machine's better than the one that went before, and you, there's no picture of that washing machine on there. But it's also quite, and I think this is quite spectacular, it's also saying, um, that, well, the, the, uh, the older washing machine is missing, but so is the thing that goes with this chimp. It doesn't mention the chimp, right? And I think what it's saying is, this washing machine is better than the older one in the same way that humans are better than chimps, okay? Which is not the case. And hopefully at the end of this, this lecture and maybe the, the practical, you'll see that that's not the case, okay? So, of course, we didn't evolve from chimps. Chimps and humans had a common ancestor about six and a half, seven million years ago, as we'll see. And also, we're not better than chimps. We wouldn't do very well in the chimps' environment. Neither would the chimp do very well in ours. So I think, but for me, one of the most important things that comes out of this is that when we look, uh, think about evolution, it's out there. Everybody's got an opinion implicitly or explicitly. Previous to Darwin, ideas about evolution um, uh, were all about ordering things hierarchically. So the best things, the most complicated things, the most perfect things at the top, and the more imperfect things uh, at the bottom. Whereas post-Darwin and the origin of species, we've got all sorts of things at the ends of these branches, all sorts of organisms from worms, spiders, people, chimps, and they're all equally fit. They're all equally good. They're just operating differently in their different environments. So there's a tree, okay? And everybody from a flower, a worm, to Brad Pitt are all equally fit biologically because they're all here now. Actually, I don't know, has Brad Pitt got any kids? Anybody know? If he hasn't got any kids, he hasn't actually fulfilled his biological imperative yet. But uh, let's say for the sake of argument that he has. Okay. So what we do on a, on a tree like this is we organise things biologically by how similar they are. So Brad Pitt is more similar to a chimp than he is to a worm. 
So they're more, we organize those on the branches of the tree more closely together. Uh, the flower and the fungus are more similar to each other. So they're, they're on the branches. And the reason these things, uh, and the rest of the tree, so all the tips of the branches are living organisms that have survived, that haven't gone extinct. And all the trunk and all the other branches are extinct animals. Okay, so we would have the last common ancestor, maybe down here. And as we go up here, here we would have, say, the common ancestor six and a half, seven million years ago between Brad Pitt and a chimp. Uh, here we would have the common ancestor between uh, mammals and, and reptiles and then fish and so on. And each time we get a common ancestor further back in history. So we can reconstruct trees by looking at existing organisms and looking at their similarities and their differences and trying to group them together where they're most similar. But we can also do the same with fossils. So we can have fossil humans, fossil hominids, and we'll look at some in the lab. Uh, we'll do some measurements on some in the lab to see, uh, see if, if these things are true. One of the things we're going to do in the lab is uh, there'll be, a, there's a skeleton laid out, an unknown skeleton, and we're going to take some measurements of features of the skull, the cranium, but also of what's called the humerofemoral index, which is a measure of how long your arms are relative to your legs. And as we'll see, that tells you something about locomotion. Yeah, you measure from that top bit to the knee joint. So this is... 25. So humerus was, so the chimp was 20, that's 25, and you said 29? 29. Yeah. So it's, it's that divided, it's that times 100 divided by that. So if you've got a calculator on your phone or something, can you do that? I'm just going to skate through these because you're going to have a closer look at some of these in the lab because it's better you do it than I just tell you about it. But one of the important fossils post the split is Australopithecus afarensis, so-called Lucy. You can see from the way this um, replica has been positioned, she could walk on all fours, and we'll say a bit more about her in a minute, but she could also work in trees. She could also climb trees still, okay? Because remember, the ancestor of, of uh, chimps and humans was probably arboreal, a bit like a lemur. So if you've seen lemurs in the zoo, ringtail lemurs, that sort of thing, they're probably a bit like that. What you shouldn't think about is that the common ancestor of chimps and humans looks like a chimp, okay? Because while there's six million years here, there's also six million years here. So a lot could have happened in that time. So don't necessarily assume, like in the advert for the washing machine, that, that the common ancestor looks like that. So first thing we want to think about is locomotion, okay? How we get around. So clearly chimpanzees mainly walk on, they, they knuckle walk actually, they don't work on all fours, they use their, their knuckles, but they mainly walk on all fours, we, we tend to walk upright. So there's a chimp, you can see it knuckle walking, um, and you can see um, uh, chimps are also pretty arboreal. But you can also get around like this gibbon, you could get around swinging through the trees, and that was what we would call brachiation. So chimps would do uh, knuckle walking generally, uh, you see that gibbon, it can walk on two legs, but it generally doesn't, okay? It's swinging through the trees. But we, we get around on two legs, okay? We're clearly bipedal. Four-legged animals, like a horse, if you get around on four legs, um, then your characteristics are going to be different. This is actually, incidentally, the earliest picture of, a, of earliest video of a horse galloping that's ever, ever been taken. If the humerofemoral index is around 100, so if the humerus and the femur are the same length, then you would predict that the organism uh, would uh, walk on four legs. And if the legs are longer than the arms, you'd predict that the organism was two-legged. So you've got a tool there and you can, look, you can explore this in the, in, in the lab. If you stand like a human, if you just put your feet parallel but under your hips, right, exactly under your hips, right? Now, uh, that's a human walking and you can stand like that for indefinitely, yeah? What a chimp would do, it, if you bend your knees but keep your back straight, that's about how far a, a chimp... So feel the muscles that you're working. That's why it's inefficient for a chimp to walk because it's having to use all that muscle tone to stay... Unless you're a very good skier or unless you're sitting on the seat behind you, uh, then that's what it feels like to be a chimp, OK? So you got that? Yeah. OK, thanks. Sit down, yeah. Walking around, this is Lucy, right? And, and of course, we know she's bipedal from some of the characteristics of the skeleton. There's some very good skeletal evidence from Lucy. But you know when you, you go walking along the beach um, or in the snow, you leave footprints, okay? And when you look at your footprints, you see, you can probably just see from this one, they're not flat, 
Okay, it's not like you put a piece of wood in the, in the sand and took it out again. The heel goes in first and makes a big hole. You rotate forward and the, ball, the, the middle bit of your foot doesn't do much. And then you push off with your big toe and the ball of your foot. So there are two big pressure points. And, and the way that these footprints are enables you to reconstruct how something walked and tell that it was bipedal. You can actually tell how fast it was going, how big it was and things like that. Now you can do that with pressure plates as well. You can have a pressure plate that records the pressure that you put as you walk along. Uh, and there's one of those in the lab as well. And I'll, I'll, um, we can have a go on at that at the end of the lab session. And actually you can tell by, uh, as I'll explain, when you walk by the pressure thing, whether you walk like a chimp or whether you walk like a human. Because as I say, chimps don't have Achilles tendon, so can't do that. So anybody who's a chimp in here, we'll find out at the end of the practical session. You're going to walk across this, right? And you're going to look at this. And if you get a flat one like that, I'm blaming my shoes, but that's a chimp one. If you get two humps, uh, it's a human. So you will have to decide as he walks out. Uh, a bit of chimpy, but a bit of human. Just walk normally. Oh yeah, a bit chimpy, but a little bit of human. Just walk normally. Oh yeah, human, human. Oh, very human. Yeah, that's all right, that's human. It depends on the shoes you've got on, of course. Oh, very human. But the interesting thing is these footprints can be fossilized. This is a Lucy, Australopithecus. Uh, and the, the, what happened was, apparently, about three million years ago, this volcano erupted and there was some wet lava. And a group of three Australopithecines were walking away from the volcano, leaving footprints in this, uh, in this ash. In fact, the little one, I don't know when you've been little, if you've gone walking with your parents in the snow, the little one was walking in the footprints of the parent. Okay? And actually, so it's a family group. And it's amazing, really, when you think three, three and a half million years ago, you can see this little vignette. And they're walking away from the volcano. And at one point, you can see from the footprints that they walk away and then they turn around and look back and then continue on. Okay. Now, some people have argued, how did we get to be bipedal? How did our skeleton evolve to be bipedal? And some people have argued that we had an aquatic phase. And during that aquatic phase of our evolution, being flat in the water would allow the skeleton to develop that, which the pre-adaptation, if you like, which then allows us to easily evolve to stand upright. It turns out there's no fossil evidence to support this, but there is one piece of evidence that supports this, and that is that, uh, well, there's a, there's a few things we have, the body shape, greasy skin, which you might think is an adaptation to water, uh, less body hair, body fat, we cry salt tears, like albatrosses do, uh, to get rid of the salt potentially from the sea. And human babies, as you know, can probably know, can, can swim. There's a piece of evidence, though, that maybe we can demonstrate here with our two volunteers, OK? And that is we have a dive response. So does one of you want to come out and sit in this chair? So just, just, just wait to get a steady heartbeat. That's... You all right? You think that's all right? Whenever you're ready. Okay. There you go. See that? This is close. They went in here. See how it's separated? Oh, it's brilliant. Excellent. Oh, fantastic. I've never seen a better one than that. Yeah, mate. Uh -huh. Look at that. Okay. Do so you see that? That's the human dive response. And you do that every time you have a shower or a bath. Doesn't matter on the temperature of the water. Doesn't matter whether you're holding your breath or not. But that was put forward as evidence that we had an aquatic phase. Round of applause for the volunteers, I think. Yeah. One thing that we'll see in the lab when we look at these skeletons is um, another piece of evidence about whether we're bipedal or not is uh, the position of the foramen magnum. Okay, we're doing a lot of Latin so far. Anyone know what foramen magnum means? You know what a magnum is? It's a very big ice cream, yeah? And that's all that means. Big. And a foramen is a hole. So that's just a big hole. That's all it means, right? So people create Latin names just to scare you off. So hopefully one of the things you get from this is don't be scared by Latin names. Okay. The foramen magnum is where your spine goes in. Okay. So you think about it. If you're bipedal, again, like with the chimp walk, you don't want to waste energy constantly having to hold your head up. What you want is your head balanced on your spinal cord so you use the least energy possible. So you want your foramen magnum in the center of, your center of gravity of your skull. So that's what you tend to find in bipedal organisms. 
that the, 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 the forma magnum is in the center of the skull, at least in the center of gravity. Whereas in, this is a shrew-like creature, a four-legged creature, the spine comes into the back of the skull and the muscles have to hold the head up, yeah? Because you've got, the, you've got the skull there and then it comes in the back and holds it up. So that's also a diagnostic of being bipedal. So Neanderthals were bigger than us and possibly had a bigger brain than us on average. They look at this area and see, is it bigger in certain, you know, is it bigger in Neanderthals or Homo erectus? And if they, they can put the skulls in MRI scans now and actually see how big they are and then sort of make some supposition about whether they could speak or not or whether they had the processing power to do any speech. Which brings me nicely onto brains. Um, because that's another difference between humans and chimps, okay, the size of the brain. Hopefully we'll be able to measure that in the lab. We have a, we have a brain that's about three or four times as large as chimps, okay. We'd, so that, that has presumably happened up our uh, branch of the evolutionary tree. Again, as I said, having a large brain is not necessarily an advantage because you've got to feed it. So there must be payoffs, there must be trade-offs as to why the brain's important. Our brains are larger than other animals in relation to body size. So if you measure uh, all, these, all these animals, and you plot body weight against brain weight, you get this relationship. So a mole and a rhino effectively have the same brain size per gram of body weight, which is sort of what you expect. Because if you have a bigger animal, you need a bigger brain to run it, bigger computer to run it, if you like. But we have a brain seven and a half times bigger than you'd expect for our body weight. Or put another way, our brain is about one and a half kilos or one and a half liters. Uh, sitting in your head, controlling you. If you just weighed you and then said, how big should your brain be? It should be about 200 grams, okay? So that's how big your brain should actually be based on this relationship. So we are the, that's the thing that makes us different, okay? So, you know, chimps and that sit on this line as well. So we are significantly different in terms of the relative size of our brains, seven and a half times bigger than it should be. So the big, the big jump in brain size that I said that we'd see in the lecture, you see it there. So about a million years ago, hominids started to get a bigger brain size. You've done that measurement, so you've seen it for yourself. And we don't know, could it be due to cooking? But the other, the other thing, if you look at these, you've seen the, way, you've seen the way that one's got a slopey face. And then as they go through evolutionary time, they get a bigger face. This is because this part of the brain, what gives you a forehead gets bigger, and that's called the frontal cortex, right? And these don't have one, and we do. And some people think the higher brain functions, the things that make us human, are actually there. So the visual processing, which is going on now, a couple of things just to think about how clever your brain is, right? If you just look at over in this corner of the room here, and then look over in that corner of the room there, right? Just flicking your eyes, right? What you don't see when you do that is any panning shot, okay? You don't see a sort of gentle pan across. You just see the corner of the room there and the corner of the room there. That information's gone into your head, it's gone into your brain, but your brain has saved time by just cutting it out. It doesn't need to know that, it's not important. It needs to know that corner, that corner, and it cuts the bit in the middle out, okay? No panning shot. And the other thing is, it's, it's doing stereo vision now as you're looking at it, but you're not seeing stereo. You, you, you can't see two images, they're put together. So the simple thing to do, just to show you that that's what's happening, if you shut one eye and cover that dot with your thumb, just like that, and then keep your thumb still, close, open your other eye, you'll see it move. So you can see, you can uncouple those two images, right, really simply. Your brain's doing all that now. It's doing all that cutting out stuff, it's doing all that editing on the hoof. It's putting these images together in colour. And, and that, that's the amazing thing that it's doing. It's, uh, and it ultimately allows us to, to, to live in these societies because of facial recognition and things like that. Facial recognition, see, it's really good at. Okay, so there's a face, looks a happy face, but you could, the brain's now, your brain's now being fooled because it's just taking some cues, it's taking shortcuts again. Actually, that's what that face looks like if you turn it the other way up. So what your brain's doing is taking shortcuts again. It's like the panning shot. It's cutting bits out. Uh, it's saying, that, oh, yeah, happy face. Yeah, I'm not threatened by that. There's certain cues that it's using. It. And then when you look at it, actually, the other way up, it's like that. Okay? So it's a complicated machine for doing all these things, but it can be fooled because it's taking shortcuts. And that's why it's so good at processing all this information. All that parallel processing that's going on, they're trying to design into computers. You can do it already. You're already doing it.